Shopify Masters is powered by Shopify, the easiest way to sell online, in person, and anywhere in between. To get an extended 30-day trial, visit shopify.com slash masters. You don't want to fight those big companies on a level playing field because you'll lose. Um, If the playing field is even, they will beat you every time. Hey, my name is Felix. I'm the host of Shopify Masters. Each week, we learn the keys to success from e-commerce experts and entrepreneurs like you. In this episode, we'll learn prototyping tips from a NASA engineer, how to tilt the playing field in your favor when competing against billion-dollar companies, and what kind of products to bring to market when you are not technical. Today, I'm joined by Mark Aramley from BedJet. BedJet sells a cooling, heating, and climate control system made just for your bed so you can find your perfect sleep temperature. It was started in 2013 and based on Newport, Rhode Island. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Felix. Glad to be with you. Yeah, so tell us a little bit more about the, the product. What is, it, what is the BedJet exactly? Sure. The BedJet is, is a world's first. Uh, it is the first uh, super fast cooling, heating, climate control for your bed. It's a machine that goes under your bed or next to your bed. For anyone who's ever woken up too hot or too cold or sweaty, you can just press a button on a remote control and have your bed feel exactly the way you need for good sleep. Uh, the product it gets incredible reviews. Where we've actually become the highest customer rated product uh, in the entire mattress category on all of Amazon. And uh, that's in big part because the machine just doesn't, uh, doesn't just make you more comfortable in bed, but people are getting better sleep. And when you get better sleep, you know, better nights, um, turbocharges, better days, mm-hmm. and uh, very, very impactful on people. So we've been very, very fortunate that uh, in its first product release, you know, the machine and the product have been very uh, successful in the marketplace. Very cool. So the I've seen I actually saw this product on Shark Tank. I do remember seeing it. And we'll get into your Shark Tank experience in a bit, um, but certainly a unique product that I haven't seen before. How did you come up with the idea behind this? Uh, I'm an engineer by training and uh, used to work uh, on the spacesuit program with NASA um, right out of school, and I worked on some of the climate comfort systems of the suit back then. And, you know, I've always had personal sleeping problems myself, uh, particularly sleeping hot and waking up at 3 a.m., you know, having to throw the sheets off because I'm too hot, two hours later being too cold and pulling them back on. And, you know, one day I just woke up and I said, how is it we can keep astronauts perfectly comfortable in space? And yet here we have a bed where we're all spending 30 percent of our lives and we're still challenged by it. So it was uh, really started out as a, a tinker hobby project. Uh, I designed and built the first bed jet Frankenstein prototype on my kitchen table just to see if I could. Uh, once the, the prototype um, was testable, I tried it out and I had other folks try it out. And the universal feedback was, you know, Mark, this thing feels pretty good. Uh, and so we decided to turn it into a business and commercialize it. Yeah, so this idea of first creating a prototype yourself um, is certainly, I think, one of the best ways to get started, right? Create something that you can actually get into market to test with people that could be potentially your customer. Talk to us about this process of prototyping. How, what was the time frame involved? How many iterations did you go through? Right, right. So every new product idea, you've got to build something to test it and to have other people test it. Um, you know, I've been around the block long enough to know that you don't create a business just off passion. You don't create a business and, you know, invest your life savings or take out loans just because you personally are a believer. Uh, really the only opinions that matter in the world of new products are paying customers and people who take money out of their wallet to buy it, try it and either decide to keep it or return it. And so having a prototype uh, before getting too invested is incredibly important. Um, You've got to be able to get field experience and feedback from real-life people uh, on your concept. So for us, 
um, you know, the, the tinkering phase, the proof of concept, just to see, well, will this thing work, uh, was probably about four to, I think, four or five months. And the first Frankenstein prototype, Felix, was the ugliest thing you've ever seen. I mean, it was uh, built with a, a, a motor from a broken hand dryer and, you know, junkyard parts and it all cobbled together and wires everywhere. And, you know, in a, in a steel box, and um, I put it together so quickly, the, the on-off switch was, uh, I had to reach it by sticking a, a pen through a hole in the box and, uh, and, and pressing it. So, you know, but th- that was enough to find out, hey, this, this thing actually works. Um, and, you know, to start um, placing it in folks' homes to, to try out for themselves to give me the feedback. So getting that feedback is vitally important. You want to spend as little money as you can for the most basic proof of concepts you can put together. And I would say, you know, setting aside my time um, and, and not not accounting for my personal time, I probably spent less than ten thousand uh, dollars on that prototype. But again, very crude. Um, I'm an engineer, so I was able to do a lot of things myself in terms of building it and designing it. Um, but the next stage really was to say, okay, let's get something more representative of, you know, what this thing might look like in, um, in a consumer's bedroom versus this Frankenstein machine, you know, with, with wires and motors and all sorts of, you know, things sticking out of it. Um, that we also focused on really spending the least amount of money we could. Um, and, and I can't speak more favorably and strongly about the most important part of our prototyping and market research, which was uh, holding a, a, a Kickstarter. Um, you know, it's, it's the ultimate test, market test, uh, for a product that's as new and, and radical and innovative. You know, you're inventing a, a new product category, essentially, that people haven't seen with a bed yet. Uh, there's nothing more powerful to give you market feedback than a Kickstarter or Indiegogo crowdfunding campaign. And that helps fund your business if you're successful. If you, you know, put the product out there and nobody wants it, you know, that's a, that's a pretty good, um, demonstration that maybe your idea isn't as great as you thought it is, as, as it was. You know, if you have overwhelming success and, you know, you can generate a tremendous amount of pre-orders, that's some great market validation that, you know, this prototype concept has some legs that people are willing to pay for. But but more importantly, those folks then help you um, help fund you creating the production ready product. And that was exactly the process we went through. Um, Once we had that massive validation on Kickstarter and we you know, one of our Kickstarters wound up being the top 10 technology Kickstarters of 2015. Uh, you know, we, we pre-sold over a million dollars worth of bed jets in just 40 days. After seeing that kind of response, it was clear to me, you know, this is a business, this is a product, there's a latent demand here. And that was the point where I did the crazy entrepreneur thing and doubled down and drained my life savings and mortgaged my house and mortgaged my mother's house and, uh, literally you know, grabbed every penny I could beg, borrow, and steal uh, to get this thing into production. And uh, but but doing that and you know taking that kind of financial risk, I you know never recommend doing that just off personal passion and mm. personal belief in the product. You got to have that outside uh, market validation, and not from a handful full of people, but but from a lot of folks. Right. So that, that validation is the key to all of this and which goes back to, to testing. And you did this in different stages, different phases where you first tested, I'm assuming with people that you knew and then eventually on Kickstarter, which you also get into with, you know, random strangers online to see if they would buy it. Now, when you are, when you were prototyping, I think other, other listeners out there are going through this process of wanting to bring a new product to market and they're creating their prototype. You mentioned that, you know, it's like a Frankenstein product that you created initially and it wasn't pretty. Uh, how do you know when a product is ready enough for for testing? You know, because you could build something, maybe spend too much time on it, or maybe you could spend too little time on it. How do you find that perfect sweet spot to know, okay, this is good enough to go out and test? Right. So, 
uh, first, let, let's talk about um, the basic product development, um, and I think it's important to cover this. Yeah, I'm not a wealthy guy. Uh, I've done okay in life, but I, I self-funded all of all of this early development. Um, you know, we went to Shark Tank, and and they hated me, and they hated my product, and they told me no one would ever want a bed yet, and and you know there was no help there. Um, of course, we got the last laugh on that because um, you know we we did get into production, and we're number one in the country now for what we do, and. Um, you know, we're the highest customer rated product on the, in the mattress category on Amazon and, and the company's doing fantastic. But, you know, along that way, um, you know, I really look at it as how much money do you spend? How much money do you want to put into product development before you reach those various checkpoints? And it's very important to know, um, I did this on a shoestring budget. Uh, there are two ways of engineering new products. There's the full ticket, full retail price, the way big, you know, uh, large consumer appliance um, or billion dollar type companies do things, right? They have massive engineering departments. They spend literally years creating new products. If I had dropped Bedjet into, uh, let's say, a billion dollar mattress company like a Tempur-Pedic or a Sleep Number or one of those people, literally, they would have taken two to three years um, or longer to get a product into the market and spent um, on exactly what I did easily multi million dollar budget, you know, two, three, four million dollars. That's just how those folks work. They pay full price. If you're smart about things and you utilize, you know, the what I call the distributed economy of, of Global resources, um, freelancers and engineering consultants and, you know, hiring a, a $10 an hour engineer in a, in, a, in a foreign country to help you with things. You can do things on the cheap. And if you're smart about it, you can spend a fifth to a quarter of what the big guys would spend to develop something that is maybe 80 or 90 percent as good as what they would have spent. And, you know, that was a process we took because, you know, not being an independently wealthy guy and having to fund this thing myself, every penny counted, every penny, um, you know, was looked at, how can we save money, you know, to get A to B here. And so, um, keeping that dollar amount low in those first few prototypes before you get to these market validation checkpoints, incredibly important. And, and folks just need to realize there's a, there's the, the high price road that traditional companies take. And then there's us scrappy entrepreneurs who find the, find the low cost resources, find ways to do things uh, at a lower price. And, you know, you can compete against those big guys. Um, you know, we went up against literally the, the folks I talked about sleep number and Tempur-Pedic who, you know, have tens of millions of dollars to spend on development and, and marketing and <clears throat> on a, a shoestring budget, you know, my me and my little raggedy band of engineers have run circles around those guys. And we've actually, in this particular niche, taken the market lead away from them. Uh, and we're competing quite well against them um, in the marketplace. So, uh, you know, folks shouldn't think that, you know, going up against massive billion-dollar incumbents with products and product development that you need their massive budgets. You just need to be a little smarter, a little more efficient, and a little more nimble um, with your your dollars and your your engineering projects. Mm. Now, well, what do you what do you find that that uh, people, whether it be a large company or an entrepreneur that's creating a product, what do you find that they do maybe waste too much money on, or maybe waste too much time on during this initial phase of of uh, designing and prototyping a product? I think they probably, many folks make the mistake of thinking you need a finished product um, in order to do some validation. And they think that they've got to get 90% of the way done before they can do market validation. And, you know, like I said, with, with Bedjet, it was an ugly prototype that just ha- had only the most basic functions that our current product has. Maybe, maybe 10%. I, it, you know, it cooled and it heated. You could barely adjust it. Um, you know, it had a basic uh, app to turn it on and off. You know, in the current product, 
you know, you have con- regulated control by degree, you have programmable settings by hour, you have acoustic damping, you know, you have silky quiet custom digital DC motor. All those things weren't there in the first prototype. You know, you've got to distill the value of what you're creating down to a few fundamentals and just make those fundamentals work. It doesn't have to look pretty. And I think a lot of folks think you've got to have something, uh, you know, that's closer to the finish line before you start your market validation. And that's where you can spend a lot of money. Got it. Now, when you were going through these tests, what were some things that, that you learned about the product or the market as you were testing? Um, you know, one of the things that, that surprised me, um, when the bed jet was first being developed, um, I, I thought, you know, this is going to be uh, a comfort item. This is, this is just a little bit of luxury. I don't like getting into a cold bed in the winter. I don't like being hot in the summer. You know, it's, it's, it's a luxury item, uh, it's purely for comfort. What we didn't know and what I had no idea is that when we released the product, um, there were these massive communities of folks out there who have all sorts of medical problems relating to sleep and temperature, uh, menopausal women who, you know, have hormonal changes and they get hot flashes and night sweats, um, cancer and chemotherapy patients who have medically induced, you know, night, they're waking up literally drenched in sweat and the product solved those problems uh, for those folks. And, you know, the list goes on and on. It was, you know, MS patients, Reynolds disease, uh, you know, elderly people with poor circulation. We just, we just had no idea of this whole other market out there that, that wasn't interested in comfort but pain relief and, you know, solving a, a, a very challenging problem with not being able to sleep. They found us. And, you know, the lesson learned on that is, you know, you got to get your product out into the market. Don't overthink. Uh, don't spend six months or a year trying to develop the perfect marketing plan. Just get it out there. Get it out there. And what you're going to find is that some of your best customers and your best demographics are actually going to find you. But you've got to be open to knowing that. And once we realized that um, these these people were were coming to us and and uh, getting something out of the machine so much more than regular people because it was solving a painful problem in their life, you got to adjust your marketing and you got to adjust your, um, your strategy and how to find those people. So I think that was for us probably the biggest surprise on the journey is uh, releasing a product for, you know, one category of people, like, you know, the gadget people who just love technology and finding out that there's all these other folks that, um, that we should have uh, marketed to and everyone thought of. Mm. Yeah, that, that's, um, that's, that's something I heard recently too from the entrepreneur that they pivoted their company, but it wasn't so much changing the product, but just changing the demographic that got the most use out of the product, that were most passionate, that found the most value out of the product. And I was going to ask you, what, how does that change your messaging and change your marketing? Once you did find out that these are people that were in pain and needed your product, do you just kind of pivot away from your initial, uh, I guess, target market and then focus only on them? Like, How do you manage this new demographic that opened up? Well, you've got to make your decisions on data, right? Um, not gut feel, not anecdotal stories. You know, you've really got to have data. And, and we studied our data very hard. And what we found is, you know, 50% of our business it, it was our original target market. But this whole other 50%, uh, was out there that we didn't uh, know about or or think about, and once that sunk in, you know, we absolutely absolutely did pivot. Um, you know, we started spending advertising more targeted towards those folks, uh, creating marketing materials um, more oriented, you know, towards, for example, menopausal women, um, creating custom content uh, on the website uh, and blogs, you know, specific to those folks. So, but you've got to make those decisions based off data. And, you know, Google Analytics gives you wonderful information on demographics and age groups. Um, you know, our customer service group, you know, is able to log every conversation we have. We always ask folks, you know, where'd you hear about us? You know, what brought you to the machine? 
Um, that data-driven approach is is really critically important towards pivoting your company. And those those stories are endless, Felix, of folks who come to the market with a product or service, and five years later, their greatest success either comes from a completely different market they didn't expect, or some derivative product that 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 they evolved into. Right. Yeah, I think that's uh, the important point about wh- how you don't want to swim against the current as well, because a lot of times entrepreneurs will come in with this idea of who is their ideal customer, who is their target customer, and they just can't make it work. And they're so focused on trying to make what they think is the target customer work rather than seeing this new opportunity based on the data, based on seeing how people are are searching you out already, you might as well use that momentum and discover that there is a, uh, a more desperate need for your product elsewhere and focus your energy there instead, instead of trying to force something that isn't working already. So I think that's a big part of entrepreneurship is being able to recognize where the momentum is at and putting your, your energy and your dollars and your time uh, behind it. Now, you mentioned that you are competing against these billion-dollar mattress companies. How do you make a a brand or a a product, a company, defensible in the long term against a company that has, you know, will probably always have more money than you that they could just kind of throw around without a blink of an eye? How do you prepare to essentially, I guess, go to battle against these larger companies? Right, right. You... Don't even try unless you've got the better weaponry in your arsenal, right? So if we were coming to the market with a Me Too product that was just like what they have, you know, a little bit different, um, maybe a little bit lower price, you wouldn't be successful. Um, You don't want to fight those big companies on a level playing field because you'll lose. Uh, If the playing field is even, they will beat you every time. Um, those companies have literally 1,000 times the marketing budget we have. And so, you know, the secret sauce of how we've been able to compete with these guys and, and literally, I mean, run circles around them is a simple formula. You tilt the playing field in your favor. Uh, you don't make it a level playing field by coming to market with a couple key elements. One, we created a product that was more powerful, more features, more effective, better technology, um, higher customer rated than anything that's ever come out before or since. So the technology itself was just better, right? We came out with something that was uh, a massively better mousetrap. And when I say better, um, it, 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 uh, order of magnitude better, right? Not something that's just a little improved. You start there and you couple that with those guys have high overheads. They're big companies. They spend, you know, huge amounts of money on branding and and marketing and being public companies. So the second part of that equation is we're half the price. So you couple having a better machine, better technology, uh, customer satisfaction that is, is stellar next to what they've been trying to offer with a product is literally 50% of what they're offering. Um, no amount of marketing and no amount of marketing dollars they spend um, is going to beat us. Uh, and in fact, I'm licking my chops at the prospect of them ramping up their marketing because we are in a category that has no awareness. You know, mm. nobody's out there Googling uh, climate control beds. You know, millions of people are Googling for mattresses, and that's great and and easy for folks to dip into that demand. But we've got to create the demand and create the awareness. So I'm fortunate that, you know, I've created a product that's now taken the lead in, you know, every category you can judge yourself, technology, performance, power, speed, features, price. And so when those guys spend money on advertising, to create brand awareness on this product category, right? Climate control beds, people start Googling and they start looking and then they come across us and it's been uncanny. Every time we've seen um, a marketing surge from one of these competitors, our sales go up 
uh, because people do do the research and they come to find, wow, yeah, BedJet's got 90% five-star reviews and Sleep Number's got 2.6 stars on their product and it's twice the cost and look at all these features and it becomes a no-brainer. So you can't compete against those guys on a level playing field. My company would never release a new product that didn't didn't stick to that magic formula of massively better product, more features, more power, um, combined with an order of magnitude price difference from those billion dollar incumbents. Yeah, and, and you know, speaking of their budgets, they obviously have huge marketing budgets, and uh, but also, what about their R and D budgets? Wouldn't they also have a lot of money to put behind a product that could be better than uh, than a company that has a smaller budget? You'd think it works that way, but it doesn't. Yeah, I see. Um, I've actually consulted for some of these folks, and I can tell you that they spend millions. Million in our category, they've spent millions of dollars, and what's come out the other end has been inferior technology to what my scrappy little engineering team has been able to do. The, being able to do that comes back to um, me as as an engineer and as an inventor, and you know the the superstars that I have on my team. Uh, but I can tell you that a, a compact three to five man engineering team uh, that has real superstars on it and, and, you know, really brilliant people can out engineer a, you know, on, on a few hundred thousand dollar R and D budget or half a million dollar R and D budget can out engineer and bring to market a product uh, faster than uh, a 20 or 30 man team who has $3 million at their disposal. Is it because there's like too many cooks in the kitchen, too much bureaucracy? What is it that you find that is the issue? It's the big company mentality. It's exactly that. Too many cooks in the kitchen, um, bloated engineering groups. Um, you know, my experience with engineers, honestly, three out of four aren't worth a dime. Um, they are average guys that are good at, um, I would say, uh, non-creative design, you know, um, so solving a problem that's a known problem. But when it comes to product develop, new product development and inventing something completely new, there's very few engineers out there that, that have their creative side of their brain functioning as well as their, their mathematical and, and CAD and, and sort of logic driven side. And when you can find those people, I, I'm fortunate I happen to be one of those people. That's, that's, that's where this company was born. But if you can find and recognize those people, um, a couple of them together can run circles around, um, you know, these billion dollar companies and their bloated engineering teams and, and their huge budgets. Um, you know, you see it in the software world, right? Where small startup companies, mm -hmm. Um, develop very innovative softwares or apps or, uh, you know, things that, you know, IBM couldn't figure out and Microsoft couldn't figure out and Oracle and, you know, all these, these massive companies with their, with their thou literally thousands of engineers, you know, why did the innovation come from three guys in a basement? Um, that, that's many times where it starts. What's happening now is that, you know, the IT world and the tech, the, the software tech world, that's been... Uh, the norm for a long time. And what's happening now is technology is evolving to the point where now hardware companies and companies that are making physical products can also follow that same path of very low cost innovation of physical products, um, faster, better, cheaper than, you know, these big traditional companies can. Mm, so I think the lesson here is that being a small company, being agile, lean, has uh, huge advantages over a larger company. And then if you can use that, that to your advantage to get ahead into to the top of the category, once the larger companies get to that point where they are investing in the marketing behind it, they're going to push the entire category uh, into into the market for you. And now you're, you're essentially rising with their marketing budget 
charges without you having to put a dollar into because you've made it to the front of the pack already. I think that's a great um, insight that, that I hadn't considered before, but it makes a lot of sense now that you've explained it. Uh, now, for, for folks out there that are looking to to, to innovate, to build products, but they don't have the, the skill set that you have, the experience that you have, and they are likely looking for engineers to work with. What tips do you have for essentially non-engineers looking to hire one or maybe eventually a team of engineers to help them innovate or build a product? Right. If you're a non-technical type, um, I only recommend folks trying to create and invent and bring the product new products if the products are very simple. Um, you know, uh, when I say simple, like a, you know, couple of small plastic parts, um, you know, our product has, you know, microprocessor and power electronics and custom digital motor and ceramic stone thermal element. I mean, everything is, is, is highly engineered and trying to bring a, a non-technical person into that level of complexity and you can spend so much money and, and get nowhere. So for folks that are thinking about new products that are, are not technical and don't have that background, um, it's an exciting place to be, but I, I only recommend entering it if your product, you know, is something that's very easy to get your arms around, not complicated, doesn't have sophisticated electronics or lithium batteries or all, you know, all this stuff. Um, because then there's resources out there that you can hire. There's, you know, engineering consultants. You can go to all the freelancer boards, uh, you know, out there and, and find folks who are contract by the hour, you know, product designers and engineers. And, um, you know, half of those folks, um, will waste your time and money, but the other half, uh, are good. You've got to sift your way through and, um, you know, make sure that, that if you get, you didn't get a good one, that you just move on uh, to the next. Um, you know, we've used a lot of engineering consultants uh, along the way for product development, uh, folks that we couldn't afford to hire as a full-time employee, but we could rent them for a month, um, you know, to get us where we needed to be. But, um, you know, I, and I, I certainly don't want to discourage anybody who feels they have a great idea, but um, the simpler the idea is, the more likely you're to be uh, successful if you're non-technical. Mm -hmm. So based, based on your experience, uh, you really cannot buy the talent or the, the experience if you don't already have some of that yourself to begin with? Um, I, I, I don't want to say that. I think that everyone is capable of growing into new areas and growing into areas where they don't have expertise. I think with new product development, there's there's so many pitfalls between mm -hmm. an idea and a warehouse full of product. You know, the the chasm between that concept and a warehouse full of product that you can ship and sell is so much bigger than most folks know. And there's so many uh, pitfalls that, that can just shut you down completely along the way. Um, it's not for the faint of heart. Uh, and you know, the simpler your idea is and the simpler the manifestation of this product that you, you have an idea for is the more likely you are to succeed. Mm, so maybe not perhaps, perhaps not for the very first company or first product you bring to market, but once you get that experience of launching smaller products, you can add the complexity and bring more and more technical products in the future. But to start, right. it might be a better idea to start something simpler. That makes sense. Um, now I want to talk about your 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 experience on Kickstarter. So I looked up your the, I guess the profile on Kickstarter, and I noticed that you had two uh, campaigns that ran. You have the Bedjet, I'm assuming the version one Bedjet, and then Bedjet V2. Um, Bedjet V1 uh, raised almost $60,000, eclipsing the, the goal of $38,000. And Bedjet V2 uh, was uh, much, much more successful, raising uh, over $1.3 million from over 4,000 backers. What was the difference between those two campaigns? Did you, I guess, they're obviously one was way more successful than the other. What was the difference between the two? Uh, the first one was when we had uh, really just the Frankenstein prototype. Um, we could have been considered a high-risk Kickstarter campaign. Uh, mm -hmm. We weren't very far along. We were pitching very basic features, just pretty much, hey, be cool, be warm, uh, you know, on demand. Um, it was a very simplistic machine. 
And, you know, the Kickstarter community has a good gauge on a perceived level of risk. And I think that first campaign was clear, you know, uh, this is a company nobody ever heard of. Uh, This is a a weird device nobody's ever seen. Um, and, And to be honest, we weren't sophisticated at all as a team in marketing it. Uh, literally it was, it was just me and a couple of engineers, uh, working out of the house. And, um, you know, the, the video was shot by myself. The, the Kickstarter was created by me. I mean, it was the most basic crude crowdfunding campaign you could put up. Um, but we got great validation off it. The second one we held, um, not too long after was after we already had, uh, some basic product in the market and we wanted to evolve it into something, uh, something better. And, uh, you know, we had a, a, uh, more, uh, mature, uh, marketing function in the company. So we were better able to promote it. Um, we had a more professional video, you know, we had money to spend on that. Um, the product itself had been in the market for some time. So there were reviews on it. And, you know, going back to that validation of people saying, oh, hey, this thing's real. It's um, people love it. You know, there's there's a couple hundred uh, positive reviews on Amazon, um, you know, brings people's perceived risk uh, on a Kickstarter that that their um, contribution is actually going to, you know, uh, be fulfilled with a, a physical product arriving at their door, you know, some months in the future. And. You know, Kickstarter and Indiegogo, they have very high failure rates. I mean, you know, it's, it's like the Wild West casino when you put your money in on um, a product, particularly, you know, some of the bigger ones, you know, the, the ones that reach, you know, a million dollars or more. So many of them just never deliver. So I attribute a lot of that success of the second one really to just those three factors. We were perceived lower risk. Um, it was an evolution of a product. Um, that already had some uh, some customer feedback and public feedback on it, and we were just a more sophisticated company able to better market and and present the crowdfunding campaign. Got it. So it's interesting that you point out that there was a lot of validation, not just uh, by you uh, improving the Kickstarter campaign page, but because of all of the, the trust and validation from the community outside of your Kickstarter page, whether it be on Amazon or other review sites that are talking about the product. I think that's important. I think a lot of folks will focus on just the Kickstarter page, but people will do the research, right? They're not just going to look on Kickstarter. They're going to look on, they're going to Google your product and your company to see if it's something that's safe for them to invest in or to, to a pre-order. Uh, now, you mentioned that you, you learned a bunch of things during this Kickstarter campaign, uh, I guess uh, both of them. What were some things that maybe surprised you uh, during, the, let's say, the second campaign that, that you didn't uh, realize uh, prior to launching the campaign? Well, we had no idea it was going to be that big. Um, you know, after the first day, we had this massive response and it, it kept going and going. And, um, you know, we, I, I had my phone set to have an automatic text message chime every time we had a backer and the thing just started going bing, 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 bing. And, you know, we're sitting around saying, oh my God, uh, you know, what, what we had always hoped for in terms of a breakthrough moment, um, where, you know, people get it and, and they want it. It's, it's happening. It's happening now. Um, but you know what, what I think the, the best, uh, bit of learning I took away from that, that Kickstarter campaign is, you know, we were intimately involved with our backers. We, we gave them such regular updates. We told them everything that was going on. We told them all the problems we had along the way. We were honest about setbacks. Um, you know, we, we really established a relationship with those folks and I'll tell you, to this day, uh, two years later, you know, those 4,000 people in that Kickstarter, they're still, two years later, my best brand ambassadors. Um, you know, they, they love the company, they love the product, but more importantly, they're loyal. Uh, they, they feel like they were part of something because they were, right? They, they helped commercialize our company and bring us to the next level of a product that you know, is, is a hit in the marketplace now. And we love them for that. And we never stop 
letting them know how much uh, we love them for that. And, um, you know, I, I just, uh, I, I think it's, it's been one of the best experiences I've had, you know, having these thousands of people um, just feel like uh, they're part of our team. They're an extension of our team and they want to help us and they want to, you know, spread the word and, you know, tell their friends and, and, you know, post about us. Um, and I, I haven't seen that on a lot of other, uh, Kickstarter projects. And I, I truly think it's because we, we maintain such close, um, communication with them, um, to never feel, make them feel like they didn't know what was going on. Mm, that that makes uh, makes sense. I think communication has always been the the key to a lot of successful campaigns. Based on what I've heard from other entrepreneurs that have launched on crowdfunding platforms, keeping your your early supporters in the loop. Uh, now I want to talk about your your Shark Tank experience. Everywhere I read about your Shark Tank experience, I think even the email you sent me, uh, it's the story sounds much much worse than I remember when I first <laughs> first watched it. Maybe I just have selective memory because I, I actually liked the product when I saw it on on. Uh, Shark Tank. But tell us about your experience. What was it like uh, being on the show? Right. Right. So when I arrived at Shark Tank, we weren't in production yet. Uh, we had prototypes. We had no sales. You know, we were still driving towards um, releasing the product. Um, the prototypes were 100% functional, 100% representative of final production at that stage. But, you know, they, within minutes, hated my product. They hated me. Um, they, they even managed to insult my mother, although the, the editors cut that out. Um, it was as bad a Shark Tank uh, segment as you can imagine. If you ever watched the show, you know, when, when they all turn feral and negative and just dig into you, honestly, I think for the whole season six that I was part of, we probably had um, one of the toughest segments and, and controversial segments uh, as well. Uh, you know, Lori uh, Grenier, uh, the QVC lady, um, you know, had a moment there that she hasn't had. I, I don't think she's ever had with anyone else where she just literally yelled, I'm out. Um, because she was asking a question and, and I, I missed it. Um, you know, they are, you don't see it from the show, but they're, the sharks are all talking over each other. They're asking questions over each other. It's like being the president, uh, at a press conference, you know, it's very hard to keep back up. She'd asked a couple the same question a few times. And, and I just, didn't catch it because I was uh, sort of overwhelmed with, uh, you know, these the shotgunned, um, you know, questions being thrown at me. And finally, you know, she blew her top and, uh, and I apologized. I said, Lori, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry. This was uh, just an honest mistake. I just didn't hear you. And, um, you know, she, she had texted after the show. I was the first time I ever got you know angry at an entrepreneur. Now I think her reaction was, was overblown and not professional, but you know, it's TV and, and, and they like the drama there. Uh, but really, uh, it, it, it went as badly as, um, it could have gone for us. Um, however, I was incredibly grateful to be there and the episode aired just as we, as we reached production, right? So after Shark Tank, you know, I, I begged and borrowed and stole all the money I could. You know, I, I drained my life savings, mortgaged my house, mortgaged my mother's house, took all that money to get us, squeak us into production. And literally the same month we started shipping product, the episode aired. And, you know, the thing with Shark Tank is if you can make it through your segment without becoming a, a very unlikable person, and, 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 and not, you know, making an ass out of yourself. Even if the sharks hate you, even if they hate your product, as long as you have a product that resonates with people, where people say, yeah, yeah, I get that. I, I think I want that. As long as you can make it through the segment um, without, you know, making yourself personally unlikable, um, it's incredible PR. It's incredibly beneficial. Every time we had a Shark Tank rerun, we'd see a huge surge in sales. So I'm grateful, um, you know, regardless of how it turned out, I'm, I'm grateful for the experience. Uh, but more importantly, uh, it, it helped us. Uh, it helped us tremendously in our first year. Uh, it continues to help us uh, on the reruns. And at the end of the day, I get the last laugh. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they told me nobody would ever want my product. You know, we were doomed to fail. And, you know, guess what? People do want our product. You know, we have a multi-million dollar company right now. We're growing. We're number one in our field. 
And, you know, it's been a fantastic success by any entrepreneurial standard. And we got to deal with QBC on our own without their help. Uh, so I, I definitely walked away from that experience, um, you know, with the last laugh, uh, on, on those folks. And, um, I do believe in the history of the show that Bedjet is one of the top five most successful companies to go through Shark Tank with a fail in terms of follow on revenue success. Amazing. So it certainly sounds like you did get the last laugh. Thank you so much for your time, Mark. Bedjet.com, B-E-D-J-E-T.com. Where do you want to see the, the company go next? What do you have planned for the next, uh, next year? So we've been growing quickly. Uh, we've been in the market now two and a half years. Um, in our second year, we grew 300%. This year, uh, we're on track to grow 200%. I think we're going to do another 200% next year. So, you know, we are we're chasing, you know, trying to be um, a healthy mid-sized company. Uh, we're going to be releasing another product uh, at the end of the year, which is just as innovative as the bed jet, just as disruptive in the sleep industry. And, you know, thumbs our nose at the business, the billion dollar mattress companies in the same way. We're going to be releasing something that has, you know, more tech, more features, more power, more everything at half the price. Uh, and so, um, you know, that's, that's our focus. We are a sleep tech company and, uh, you know, that's, that's where we're going to continue to expand over the coming years. Awesome. Thank you again so much for your time, Mark. Thank you, Felix. My pleasure. Here's a sneak peek for what's in store in the next Shopify Masters episode. Traditionally speaking, a utility patent holds a little bit more weight and is a little bit more valuable. When we were going through the process, we were led to believe that utilities are a little bit stronger in the IP portfolio. Thanks for listening to Shopify Masters, the e-commerce marketing podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs. To start your store today, visit shopify.com slash masters to claim your extended 30-day free trial. Also, for this episode's show notes, head over to shopify.com slash blog.